morning, everyone. Morning. <laughs> it's good to be here and good to be thinking on spiritual matters and the blessings that we hear from each other and the praises that we hear from each other strengthens our spiritual life, drawing us close to one another. Today I'm getting more and more on the slope and thoughts of the Lord's Supper. And what must have been happening in Jesus' life, what he was thinking, what the apostles were thinking. So uh, the sermon again today will be the last days of Jesus' life as Savior of this world. While he was here in this world, living as one of us, tempted as one of us, and yet had a higher calling and a higher responsibility. Got some noise outside. <laughs> some thunder and lightning. <laughs> We uh, pray everything will go well. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> so in thinking about the this kind of a sermon or teaching, I, I love a study or teaching. Somebody asked me this week about that, and, and I said, I love to teach. So uh, to show things that are in the Bible and to understand the things and to get the thoughts of various things pertaining to the harmony of the Gospels. You know, you can always get these uh, pieces in different books and, and values and back of your Bible sometimes. It's called the life of Christ or the harmony of the life of Christ. And so when we start seeing things like that, we begin to think about, oh, we maybe should put these things all together and just, and, and I love to see the, the message, the story of the Bible coming together in pieces where this fits with this, this fits with this, and first this, and then that, oh, we forgot that one, put that one in, you know, we get things in order so that we understand how things were happening. So, uh, th and these are made, there's many of these uh, uh, stories of harmony of the Gospels or uh, other words, the harmony of the four Gospels and so on, you get the different uh, pieces of study. But when I started looking at this, I got sad. Because somebody wrote in here right away, Passion Week, which I wondered, is that the right word? Is that the right way to say that? Uh, it's not a biblical word, but you know, it just came to thought. And then the next item right under it was Sunday, the triumphant entry into the city. Oh, no. So you got to watch yourself. That's part of my sermon. Just to understand why this is wrong. Somebody made it. Maybe he's got a doctorate degree. I don't know. But somebody made this chart. And so I started studying down what's here. What's, oh, it's got to be Saturday first, then Sunday, then Monday instead of Tuesday. And, and that was about the end of that. Mm -hmm. Because you just can't harmonize it. It just doesn't work. You'd like to see some things where you can say, okay, I can, I can use this thought or I can use this idea. And then you find out, oh, they're really messed up. So we're going to see those pieces. There's other things that I'd like to tell you that we've got available. Um, this is the Lord's Supper pamphlet from the General Conference. On this one, Easter, there's more to be said from the General Conference. Good books on the, on the topic. I always wonder how they got the rabbit in the story. Uh, <laughs> it's not in these, of course. It won't be in here, but the... People that think of Easter, it's got to be pink, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. Where do they get these things in there? Uh, pagan customs, traditions, uh, commandments of man. But uh, yeah. one, in the older pamphlet of the Lord's Supper, there was these things that I, if I can find it now right here, it should be right handy, right like this. There used to be something like this, a chart of what comes first, what comes second, what comes third, was right in this booklet. It's not there now. Um, so there may be another place where it's written in or where it's found. And I believe there was another book that had some of it, but it was in kind of pieces and it was disjointed so that it didn't come together like a whole sheet, one thing after the next. And vertically, one thing after the next, what happened those days. Uh, we've made this available in eight and a half by eleven and by fourteen, and, and by eight and a half by fourteen. But also, uh, it can be enlarged, and somewhere else this is available. 
Does anybody know right away where this is? Right in this building. <coughs> oh, some people know. <laughs> it's on the wall in the hall, that long crossway hallway. And it's one about, uh, oh, it's about yay big by yay big. <laughs> uh, take a picture of it. And with your cameras, you can zoom in closer and enlarge. You, know, you can see and do things with it. Um, wasn't created here, except then it was heavily into it, <laughs> which is nice to see that being uh, developed uh, for a uh, congregation uh, other than this building. But these are great to have. We, we can always say that maybe it's not all perfect. We're humans. Okay. In fact, we found in here Passover we spelled with one S one time. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, but Passover, Pass, uh, Passover is about seven times or more in this little writing down here at the bottom. And one little mistake. <laughs> okay, it's been fixed. But uh, these things help to, uh, to guide us in trying to say what's first, what's second. What happened first in that day, what happened second, third, fourth in that day, or nothing. You know, what happened? So I started thinking on that, and I started thinking too about the, I'm going to get rid of this book, but uh, started thinking about the days of the week, and some people want to say it's this way or that way, but you know in a calendar, you can take a look at a calendar, there's twice in this calendar of this year, that the days work out so that you start number one day over here, Sunday, number one, day one. Seven is over here for the Sabbath. Right. It's yeah. twice in this year that that happens nicely. And it's good to see those things. And uh, you think of what happened in creation on day one. What happened in creation? Did he rest first and then work? Mm. Oh, no. He worked first and then was tired. And then he rested. Okay, And he wants us to do the same. So you're supposed to work six days and rest on the seventh day. Yeah. And it's never changed. Interesting, the calendars have never gone to an eight-day or five-day or six-day, ten-day. They tried sometimes to get a ten-day work cycle. Doesn't work. People wear out in six days and you need to have a day of rest. <laughs> God made it that way or created that way. So here we're thinking of, of this unity of numbers and we think about the numbering here that we're going to be looking at on the last days of Jesus' life. When did he rise from the tomb? Was it a Sunday morning sunrise program? No. no. <laughs> so let's look at those verses. So now I can put this away as well. I won't have too many things getting in my way here. And I'll put away this other one, little one. And I've got one more to tell you about. Sometimes it's nice to have something. This is a, a sheet, a little larger, but I blew it up as well. So it's about this big, in four pieces or so or more. But it's one of those kind of charts, same idea, same charts. One thing I did notice in this chart was that they knew about the change of the, the days of the week, the cycle of, of each day and the change of weeks, but the cycle of each day, that when the Bible says the third hour, when was the third hour? Ah, if you start your day here at six o'clock in the morning, here's nine. At three hours. Three hours. The sixth hour, aha, all of a sudden you begin to know what the Bible's talking about. Now, if you never learn that, you say, what are they talking about? Nine o'clock at night, you know, when did this happen? Nine in the morning? You know, the third hour? The third watch? You know, there's things in the Bible that we need to grasp, to hang on to, to understand their timepiece. They did not have a clock to tell them when midnight was. Isn't that silly? The clocks weren't invented until when Germany in such and such a year. <laughs> they did have means of calculating. They did have candles, certain diameter, certain kind of wax, and certain layers, you know, rings on it, that it would burn about an hour apiece. So they knew how many hours in the night. They could say whether it was the third hour of the night, the third watch of the night, things like that, um, where you use those words. But in general, they couldn't start a day in the middle of the dark. 
who's going to find out? <laughs> who, who made the es estimate? If it's purely speculation. If you had no clocks, no electricity, you know, who's going to who's going to figure out when it was? God had the per perfect solution. When the sun is setting, one day is ending, and as the night progresses into full darkness, the sun went down. That's the next day. Ah, you've left this day, you're starting that day. Easy. Happens every day. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. And you have night first, and then the daylight time. you got to keep that in mind when you're dealing with the Bible, because that was the system of the day. That was the only thing there was. They didn't have a digital clock or uh, an alarm that goes off or whatever. They, they didn't have those things. So, when you're thinking of the end of this day and the beginning of that day is when the sun is setting. When it's almost set, you're still in that day. When it is set, you're in that day. Very easy. It gets a little bit confusing if you say Tuesday night or Wednesday night when you really realize it's back there. The night started first and then the daylight time. Not really confusing, but you got to think in their, in their ways. you got to understand what they're way of life was, what it was like. When they said the cock crew, ah, it's morning. Everybody used to know that when you lived on a farm and had chickens and <laughs> roosters. <laughs> when the cock crew, the sun was coming up. Okay. <laughs> uh, I remember a PBS comedy thing that they did one time with the, uh, I remember, you know, you're supposed to keep your mind alert and do things that uh, are learning, continue learning. And the little girl was sneaking out there with a big floodlight to the chicken barn. And she turned the light on, the rooster crowed. <laughs> uh, so those are common things in their day that we don't think of readily. We've got to put ourselves in their shoes, in their time frame, to think on those. So here we go. Some things I've just gone on down here. But let me talk a little bit. We're talking about Roman time versus Hebrew time and ways of doing things. The Roman way of doing things, the Hebrew way of doing things, and our day. Uh, the hours of the day and the night, I talked about those. And uh, But during the dark ages of world history, the ruling powers did a lot of twisting and turning on everything. Control of people's thinking. Destroyed other thinking. They told you everybody was dumb up till that time. No, they weren't. Look in the first pages of the Bible. They already knew how to smelt iron. Oh yeah, and they knew musical instruments too. They were not created ignorant. God created us with, us with good minds. Okay, uh, going on. Uh, I mentioned about the night comes before the day in the Bible timing. Uh, I have to watch here my amount of light that I have. The uh, sunrise, sunset, I talked about that. There were divisions of the day and divisions of the night. It's interesting that 12 got chosen. Huh? 12 apostles, 12 tribes. You know. <laughs> but you know, 12 works out really, really well when you start thinking of all of our machineries and our um, digital stuff and everything, the 12 works out really good. The number of degrees in a circle, you know, 12 is involved. So lots of things. The 12 is very, very important to us. Not the 10 that some told us about. In Canada, they suddenly put out a little story about the guy that ran through the woods calling, hit, uh, wielding his weapon and hollering, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. So they made kilo, kilowatts and kilometers and kill <laughs> Uh, it was a joke, but it was not 10 pieces that worked for, you know, our systems. And I had a school, t uh, well, an engineering instructor, he took two sheets, and he called somebody up, he said, I know you like the metric system. So he says, come on up. He said, you take the paper and divide it in 10 pieces, and I'll divide mine, and so that it'll come up 12 pieces. And he went half, 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 and he was right. The other guy was still wondering, how do I make 12, 10 out of this? 
<laughs> the answer was obvious. <laughs> Visual aids, okay. Uh, so we need to think in Bible terms. Really be involved in Bible. And the Old Testament examples and wording that's used in the Old Testament, how it reaches us in the New Testament. The uh, We have to think too of the days that they celebrated, things that were very important to them. Uh, they had uh, special days or Sabbaths. They had feast days, which were Sabbaths. They had first day of the month, which was a Sabbath. By the way, last night was supposed to be new moon, but couldn't say it was too cloudy. <laughs> they did have that figured out in those days. They would have a guy on the east side and the west side of Jerusalem, and one guy in the city of Jerusalem. There wasn't the lights like we have now to block your view, okay? So they could see the new moon. But also there's people in outlying areas that would happen to be cloudy, but Jerusalem was high on a pretty much of a mountain top. And so it wasn't foggy very often. And so they would point out that when you could see the crescent of the moon, as the sun was setting, you had to be able to see the crescent of the moon after the sunset. Then you're in the new, new month. And you, do, you blow the trumpets, and this is a Sabbath. First day of the month. Now, a few days ago, they, they announced on TV that there was the new moon, and they showed the sun. But you know, it was before sunrise. The little moon was still waning and was dying. You know, it's going the other way. Moon goes that way, sun goes this way. And so the, the new moon was not yet. It was a beautiful little sliver of light. And but you couldn't see it the next evening this side because it was they probably set together or so closely one after the other you can't count it. Now mathematically, we say, oh I, I know when the new moon was. But you have to think Bible time, they didn't have the machinery we got now, the telescopes, the you name it. They had to see it before you could claim it. So if the sun was setting and the moon was too close, you don't see it. You gotta wait one more day. Then you see the new moon, you declare it to the Sabbath of the first day of the month, you name it the new month and so on. Uh, and we're concerned about the 14th day of Nisan. When you see the new moon, you can count the 14 days. Now, when you come to a full moon at 14 days, because about 28 days and 28 and a half, 29 days is the cycle of the moon. So half of that is 14 days. The Passover, leaving Egypt even, was daylight with so much sunlight, so much moonlight, reflection from the moon, so much light. And you get to think of those things too. How did they leave Egypt in the middle of the night? They had the full moon. Okay. But, but that's another topic as to when they left and so on. But you got to think in terms of no electric lights. Okay, so if you can find the, the, the Sabbath of the first day of the month. Then they were to count 14 days to come to the Passover. Okay, So we're watching that. And every time we have the Lord's Supper, I love to think of the going outside, surface is over, and there's the full moon. You know, <laughs> it's a bright, it's a nice thing. And you can't go just by the new, by the fullness of the moon, because when you have an approximate full brightness, or full brightness, or approximate late brightness, it can hardly tell the difference. But um, was there a new moon seen or not seen? It either is or it isn't. New moon, you could miss it by a day or two. And so full moon, uh, new moon is either there or not there. And then you can count the 14 days. Okay, so that's thinking in Bible time, Bible language and Bible ways, uh, and their world that they lived in. So let me go down here a little further. So you had a... a First day of the month was a Sabbath. They had uh, special feast days that, that they had to uh, keep as Sabbaths. They also had the weekly Sabbath. And then there was the calendar problem. Uh, there was the Chinese calendar, the Egyptian calendar, the Hebrew calendar, the Assyrian cal calendar, the Babylonian calendar, Medo-Persian, Greeks, Romans. Everybody had a calendar. Which one are we looking for? 
This one. Okay? God's calendar. I know it's a little bit of a difficulty when uh, there's seven times in 19 years, if I get the numbers right, that the Hebrew people have to add an extra month into the calendar. Is that a big problem? It's actually easier for them than for us. Because they either saw the moon or they didn't see the moon. And if it was shifting with the 28 days, and you needed more days, it would shift to your harvest time and your seeding time and the, the feasts and the Passovers and all those things. All of those were shifting so that we do it on an anniversary date rather than on a mathematical date. Okay. So we say, okay, what's it happening? When are the Hebrew people going to declare the extra month and move our, our Lord's Supper time and Passover time quite a bit, whole 28 days or thereabouts? But we don't have to get excited that it was a common occurrence and they didn't, they didn't have something where they had to stuff something in and force it in. No, it was just the next day was coming. But you know, the harvest time and the seed time was getting off. So they had to add this extra 30 days. Well, it wasn't 30 days, it was by new moon to new moon, regardless of how many days that took. <laughs> okay. Whether it was 28 and a half or whether it was 29 or, you know, you didn't have to worry. All you had to do was just, it was either moon or no moon. <laughs> and add the month if you needed to, add the name to another month that would be there. So we're following in the, in the old ways, doing that. Um, so then we come to this chart of the uh, uh, time element in the crucifixion and resurrection and so on, this, this chart I'm talking about here, to look at some of the things on there. Uh, in uh, the triumphant entry I mentioned about that, they're trying to get it to happen on the first day of the week, they're trying to get it to happen on a Sunday when they're having church services and they can say, everybody come out early and then we're going to go on this hill and we're going to see uh, the, the uh, sunrise program. Maybe Christ's going to return at the sunrise. The Bible says he can return anytime he feels like it. He's the charge. He's the boss. He's in charge, you know. He can come anytime he wants, morning, noon, or night, and anything in between. So... Uh, Anyway, that's a, the, of course, the, the regular services, you might say, they're trying to get the, uh, uh, the sunrise service, they're trying to get Good Friday. Is it Good Friday because Jesus got killed? Ooh, that's a bad thing to think of. That is crazy. But if they get a Good Friday, they're saying that he rose on Sunday, which is what one full day, two parts of a day, and two nights. Nothing to do with three days and three nights that Jesus prophesied was going to be it. Now a prophet, anytime you had a prophet, he was to give a sharp range prediction or more. If they happened, then you could believe his long range predictions. Or you put him to death because he's a liar and he's not speaking for the Heavenly Father. Realize how bad that is if Jesus did not stay in the grave three days and three nights? Really, really bad. So what's this about Friday? And if you do take Sunday morning and count back three days and three nights, you're still going to end up wrong. Because you didn't rise anywhere near that. Okay, I'm going to go a little quicker here, but when Jesus died, and read, read these passages, put them all in order. When Jesus died, they had to hurry to get him in the ground because the high day was coming. High day? special day. Ah, so. Then if you count from Wednesday, our Wednesday afternoon, he was being put to put on the cross and he was going to die. And he died before the sun went down, but he was buried also before the sun went down. After the sun went down, what day are you in? Thursday. <coughs> so you, if you count night first, Thursday, would be Wednesday night, Thursday night, and then you'd have Thursday in the daytime, then you'd have Thursday night, Friday morning, Friday night, and then you'd have Friday in the daytime, then you'd have Friday night would be Saturday night, right? 
and Saturday when the sun rises, you're in the daylight over here, you get three days and three nights. You have to complete the, the daylight time. Sun was setting, and Jesus rose from the grave. Amen. 72 hours, three days and three nights. But what's this about Sunday? Well, actually it isn't. It has nothing to do? No, it has nothing to do with it. By the time they came to the grave to see if he was there yet, they wouldn't have gone in the middle of the night. Okay. He was gone. That's Matthew 28. Matthew's a mathematician. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Verse 28. Matthew chapter 28. The first words of that chapter. In the end of the Sabbath, oh, we've got to stop and think. Right? When is the end of the Sabbath? Saturday afternoon when the sun is going down. In the end of the Sabbath. <coughs> As it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. Well, this word dawn gets you in trouble, but it means the beginning, right? When does Sunday begin? Saturday afternoon when the sun's going down. Because your night is first and then your day. Mm -hmm. Did it? Is it the King James only words it this way? Uh, it could be, because some of the other versions of the Bible have tampered with, with wording. But if you go back and look at the Hebrew writing translation, you can see the Hebrew and the English translation below it, and in a separate place where the, where the King James is written. Um, you'll, you'll see it there, it's very plain, that it is in the end of the Sabbath. Actually, there's one translation I looked at, and I thought, this is interesting. It says the end of the week instead of the end of the Sabbath. And I thought, is this a problem? Mm -hmm. No, actually, it's the same thing, right? The end of the week. When's the week end? Saturday afternoon. At Sunday. At Sunday. No problem. And the beginning of the following week begins when the sun goes down Saturday afternoon. Because of night first, and then the day, and so on through the next week. Mm -hmm. So it's actually either way works perfectly. Okay. Anyway, they, they were coming to the uh, tomb here to see what was going on. They'd want to read through the story. The, the uh, keepers that were watching it uh, actually knew better. And from verse 12 to the end of the chapter, they're kind of, they, they said, uh, the authorities said, well, you, you say it this way and we'll back you up. You know, we'll pay you good money for this too. <laughs> okay. So they lied. Otherwise, they'd be killed by doing, you know, being asleep on the job and not protecting what they were supposed to be protecting. But then the angel said to the women that had come, in verse 5, I know that you seek Jesus, whom was crucified. I know who you're looking for. The tomb was here. It was sealed, right? The stone was rolled there. The seal of the government was put on it, that you don't dare break that seal. Okay. Verse 6, He is not here. He is risen. And this is in enough light yet, as the end of the day was coming on, Saturday afternoon, sun was going down, there's enough light for them to be able to walk yet, and he was gone. There is nothing to do with Sunday. Okay. He was gone. Then you read the other chapters about you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find the other uh, stories, and it'll tell you of at least three visits, or four visits to the tomb, and he was always gone. Always gone. So what's this about sunrise program? Doesn't exist, okay? Man-made stories. Okay, so I want to carry on here. Oh, one thing I, I wanted to be sure and tell you, in, uh, in Daniel chapter 9, 24, 25, 26, 27, but I'm not going to read them to you, I'm just going to tell you what's there. It's a prophecy that is sometimes explained wrongly. Never has there been a prophecy where it started and then everything was held still and then the other piece of it was over here. There's no such thing. Okay, no such thing. So this needs to run through. This was called the Messiah in Daniel. We can look carefully, quickly. In, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, uh, nope, uh, should be chapter 9. I guess I have this here for a different study. But in Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 25, well, 24, talk, talks of the 70 weeks, another prophecy of long term. 
but it says what is going to happen between this time frame of these seven, uh, seven, 70 weeks, which is 490 years in prophecy. Is this going to happen? Well, actually it did happen because they were waiting for the Messiah to come. They knew this was the era, the time, the year uh, when this was going to happen. Then it says that the, in verse 25 it calls it the Messiah, the Prince. Aha, who's the Messiah? Jesus Christ. Then you go to verse 26, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be cut off in the middle of the week. How about Wednesday? That's pretty near the middle, or exactly in the middle. <laughs> okay. But it was also in the middle of seven years, three and a half years here, three and a half years here. He died in the middle of those three and a half years. He preached 33 and a half years and then died. Interesting, three and a half years. He lived to be 33 and a half, I should say. But he started preaching, and he preached for the three and a half years. Started preaching at 30, when he was of age, to teach and so on. Then he went on. And uh, so this says that the, uh, and if you go down a little further, 27, it says that he'll, uh, in one week, he shall cause the sacrificing to cease. And the oblations and so on is going to cease. Well, what is that? We need to think through this again. We need to stop and say, what is this? Well, remember when he died, that the veil was torn from top to bottom. The Holy Spirit left. You can't do sacrifices. You can't make the offering once a year offering because the veil is torn. And it was a very, very strange, strong, multi layered cloth kind of thing that could not be torn, just like that. It would take oxen pulling opposite directions to tear this cloth, it was so strong. And it was holy ground inside of there. Nobody was to look in there, nobody was to go in there, priest only, well, once a year, with a sacrifice or he'd die. And this veil is gone. The Holy Spirit is left. You can't do sacrificing. And they didn't for a long time. But they couldn't, re in, in real life, Jesus was the sacrifice. How can you sacrifice an animal when Jesus is the sacrifice? Mm -hmm. So it stopped. Things happened on that just crash. Do you remember when the lights went out for three and a half, three hours? <laughs> when Jesus died? Aha. Uh -huh. I mean, God drew a line. This is it. Everybody's going to know this. The earth shook. The graves opened. A line was drawn. This is it. Everybody knew. What did the guards say? Oh yeah, this was the Son of God. Even a guard, a soldier. Wow. I mean, it, it was that strong and that powerful as a special deal. Yeah. So, in trying to solve some of the difficulties in, in uh, the two stories from the Bible and from our time of type of life, we have to be sure and look at the high day Sabbaths and the weekly Sabbath, uh, the preparation day for the weekly Sabbaths. Uh, I don't want to overdo here too much. Um, Jesus gave the prophecy that it would be three days and three nights, and it better be or else he's a liar. And that wouldn't do no good at all. Um, we have to look at the uh, happenings. What did I write here? Uh, someone placed in the happenings of the period of time, we must also think in Hebrew timing. So we've got to put ourselves back in that time frame, think about what was happening in their culture, in their way, of how the story got written the way it was, and then Daniel 9 has to fit in there. Otherwise we've got another kind of problem that's coming up, so we have to fit Daniel 9 into the prophecy, or else Daniel is wrong, and that prophecy is all wrong. Uh, we bring up more and more troubles. Uh, the Messiah died, uh, sacrificing ceased, so I talked about all those things. I want to go on to a quick uh, beginning. We already talked about Matthew 28, 1. And uh, I wanted to go to oh, Matthew 28, 5 in the verse. I put D for the later part of the verse. And 6a, it says he's gone, he's risen. He's not here, he's gone, he's risen. 
the 72 hours I talked about. Uh, in, uh, I'm going to have to leave this from here, but I want to go on this chart and go back to the six days in uh, John 12, verse 1. I talked about six days before the Passover. And that's kind of where I'm going to have to leave this one. Jesus was there eating a meal with uh, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And Mary took some uh, uh, liquid, some tears, and washed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. And then the, uh, he said, this is, no, it wasn't the tears, it was the oil. oil because um, in verse 12 through 16, he says, um, I jumped it again. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1, 3, and 7. In uh, 3, she is anointing him with oil. And he said in verse 7, this is for the burial. And remember the disciples said, hey, wait a minute, this oil was very expensive. It could have been sold. The money could have been given. You know, so. Uh, and he said, no, she's doing this because of my burial, for my burial. But that's another thought. That's a, one of these pages. What happened on the sixth day before the Passover? This was it. And then verse uh, 12 through 16, it says the next day. What happened the next day? And that's when the, the next day would be the, uh, uh, on, on this chart, of course, we backed up those days as well. Friday was the ninth. Sabbath was the 10th. That's the next day here in John 12, 12 through 15. And he had the triumphant entry into the city. It's really good to read of all the things that happened that day. And the people were not surprised or shocked that it was happening that day. They started taking reeds and laying them down and branches and laying them down. The donkey, uh, the colt uh, of a donkey, Jesus came riding in. They had the, uh, made a, leaves down for the animal to go over. They even laid down clothing and so on. Um, and then in uh, Luke 19 is the next piece of that day when Jesus looked over Jerusalem and wept over Jerusalem. And then uh, he observes the temple and returns to Bethlehem, Bethany in Mark 11.11. 11. That's all happening on, on that Sabbath. And on the first day of the week, the next day, it was the 11th day of this whole cycle. The 11th day, we're working our way to the 14th, right? But the Sunday would be the 11th of Mason, and uh, he cursed the tree because there's no fruit on it for people to eat. Aha! Uh -huh. Timing. What happened this day? What happened that day? What happened that day? Uh, Jesus returned and cast out the money changers on the 11th, which was Sunday. Do Hebrew people do business in the temple on Sabbath, buying and selling? Oh, no way. This was Sunday when they could do it. Okay? Yeah. And then uh, Jesus leaves Jerusalem again on Sunday, going back to, to uh, his place of abode for the night. It's Monday, the fig tree dried up. The next day. You're trying to put this one day after the next day after the next. So when the fig tree dried up, it was the 12th. On the 13th, the upper room was reserved. Aha! The Passover is going to happen. I'm going to stop there. I want you to read those and get to understanding some of these. And we'll, we'll come back to the Passover time. Thank you.